Secretary, the Economy. I shall first call Lee Rowley to move, yeah. and, then, and then Sarah Newton to second the address. Lee Rowley. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I beg to move that a humble address be presented to Her Majesty as follows. Most gracious Sovereign, we, Your Majesty's most dutiful and loyal subjects, the Commons of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, in Parliament assembled, beg leave to offer our humble thanks to Your Majesty for the gracious speech which Your Majesty has addressed to both Houses of Parliament. Yeah. 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 It is a great honour to propose the Loyal Address, both for myself and for the constituency of North East Derbyshire, my home, which I am so proud and privileged to represent. Yeah. 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 I stand here this afternoon, however, firstly, to right a historic and terrible injustice. <laughs> that no member from my great county of Derbyshire has moved the Loyal Address for over 100 years. Yeah. 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 The delay has been long, Mr Speaker. It was last moved in 1903, when Colonel Gretton, representing the constituency so ably now served by my honourable friend from South Derbyshire, last moved the address. I took to reading that speech just before, this e before today to get some inspiration for the rather terrifying job that I now have. I am afraid to report it only increased my sense of nervousness about the task ahead. I discover that before the good Colonel even uttered a single syllable, Hansard notes with that courteous understatement which Hansard is famous for, that he was heard with much difficulty. <laughs> Whatever that is an Edwardian euphemism for, I think is lost to time. But I will, I will seek to avoid the challenge of my county forebearer by speaking both loudly and, at least at the start, avoiding Brexit. Oh. Secondly, another worry arose, if not for me, then for the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Leader of the Opposition. The subject which Colonel Gretton turned to first in his speech was not education or health or welfare or taxes, nor even his constituency. It is a subject which continues to be returned to time and time again in this place. Venezuela. <laughs> keen to exclaim that the recent policy successes in South America had been achieved without the destruction of personal property. Oh. I wonder whether our Venezuelan friends will have the same preeminence in 2019 that they did in 1903. And finally, I was struck by the response of the Prime Minister, Mr Bolfer, that his initial remarks were not focused on great matters of state, but instead to ensure that he did not impede upon the impending dinner hour of the members who were present. <laughs> I hope not to repeat that today by applying some Derbyshire common sense and knowing when to sit down. Yeah. I am relatively new to this place and have only been here since the 2017 general election. And having just turned 39, I think I tend, hopefully, just yeah. towards the more youthful end of the scale of the parliamentary age range. Yeah. Not least, if he will forgive me, when comparing myself with my parliamentary neighbour from Bolsover, who was in customary fine form this morning and who has been undertaking and providing quips to this House since a decade before I was born. Ah. <laughs> so, having only witnessed what... <laughs> so, so, having witnessed only... So, having witnessed only Wong's Queen's speech here today, I searched for advice about how to do it this afternoon and discovered that the best definition was laid out by my right honourable friend from Sutton Coalfield in a speech in the 1990s. My joy quickly turned to horror when, having read his remarks, I found I had been given a privilege by the Treasury bench, which is, and I quote, usually accorded to some genial old codger <laughs> on the way out. <laughs> now, Mr Speaker, I know that Brexit has aged us all in the last three years, but I didn't realise that my right honourable friends in government thought it had affected my youth so badly, nor how keen they were to apparently get rid of me. <laughs> we meet today in troubled times, at the end of the longest parliamentary session since the Civil War. It is a time 
which more experienced members of this House tell us newer recruits is just not normal. Our precious body politic lies bloodied, poisoned by rancour and enmity, and until the hope of the last few days, paralysed by competing legitimacies. Our politics is fought over, sometimes viciously, and those, by those of us here in a way that I have never known in my lifetime. And I say that as a working class kid who grew up in the North during the miners' strike, who's ne who is the nephew of somebody who worked from the NUM and whose grandparents toiled under the villages that I now have the privilege to represent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have some knowledge of challenge and tumult. We are in a hard place, and all of us, whatever bench or chair we sit in, are responsible for where we end up. In the last few days, there is at least hope that this toxic and crippling fog which we have created might just be lifting, as the Prime Minister sketches an outline of a way forward. And I speak as someone who has been robust in my review of previous proposals. But the House must surely see, as I do, we have debated long enough. This is a moment for decision, and we were elected to make decisions. If there is light at the end of the tunnel later this week, and heaven knows I hope there will be, we have a fundamental responsibility in this place to try and resolve this most vexed of problems and allow our despairing and embittered country to move on. For the health of our democracy and to restore faith in this most venerable of institutions, in my view, we simply must get Brexit done. And I hope deep down that this place realises that it is time to get to back to the other priorities of our country. And if it doesn't, this shattered parliament will be given even shorter shrift than the residents of North East Derbyshire have already given it. They speak plainly and honestly in my 41 towns, villages and hamlets. They are good, honest, industrious men and women who are the quiet backbone of our great country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Johnfield and Killamarsh, they seek only to get up every morning and get a fair crack of the whip and be able to get on. In Eckington and Clay Cross, they seek betterment in life for their families and their children, recognising that communities are built from the ground up, yeah. not imposed top down, and understanding that governments should do some things well, not lots of things badly. Yeah. Yeah. They want yeah. governments yeah. who prioritise technological advancement and innovation in healthcare to allow people to get better quickly and to live longer. They want people who stand shoulder to shoulder with our brave officers on the front line through a police covenant. And they want governments who make it their mission to deliver fast broadband to all of our nations. Yeah. Yeah. That is why there is so much to be welcomed in this Queen's speech and why we must move beyond Brexit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. My constituency sits towering around the presence of a church which has been there since the 12th century and can be seen from miles around. It is famous for a spire which twists and bends unconventionally into the sky. I am the son of that crooked spire and so very proud to represent some of its domain today. And the values of those sons and daughters of North Derbyshire are the same values as other proud, working class, <coughs> northern and midlands towns all across the country. And they're the values which propelled me here today. Hard work, aspiration, a hand up, not a hand out, freedom, liberty, society, real opportunity for ourselves and for our communities and a desire to be set free to allow our talents to achieve what we can and not be told how to live our lives. Yeah. 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 Last Friday, I returned to my old school, St Mary's in Chesterfield, to talk about the importance of democracy. It reminded me of the first time I came here, 21 years ago, on a sixth form trip, when we were welcomed by our Member of Parliament at the time, the much respected Tony Benn. I come from very, a very different political tradition to Mr Ben, but he is still held in high esteem in my constituency. In the same year he kindly showed me and my fellow students around this benches, he stood somewhere on here and asked five questions of politicians, as he did regularly. They are as pertinent today as they were then. What power have you got? Where did you get it from? In whose interests do you exercise it? To whom are you accountable? And how can we get rid of you? <laughs> I hope we remember that in the days ahead. And so, Mr Speaker, as we turn the page on one of the most tumultuous parliamentary sessions of our lives and dare to hope of new beginnings in a new one, I close by turning back to the Prime Minister, Mr Bolfer, who responded to the last Derbyshire MP to propose a loyal address. 
Mr Balfour was a remarkable man who contributed much to our civic and political life in this country. And he was reputed once to have said, nothing matters very much and few things matter at all. That may or may not be true. But in this most tempestuous of times, I hope, I think, that most of us in this place recognise that the coming days do matter, mm. that our nation is watching, anxious with hope and belief to move on. North East Derbyshire wants to move on and return to the priorities of the people so ably outlined in this programme of government. Yeah. I think the country does too. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Order to second the address, I call Sarah Newton. So thank you, Mr Speaker. It's an absolute pleasure to follow my honourable friend, the member for North East Derbyshire, who has made an outstanding speech yeah. and has demonstrated yet again what a champion he is for his constituents. Yeah. Now, Mr Speaker, when I was asked to second the humble address, I felt honoured but I also felt some consternation. Of course, it's always an honour to represent my constituents in this place. While the House may very much tire of me talking about Cornwall, I will never tire of speaking up for the Duchy and its great people. Yeah. 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 I imagine there are many people watching this debate at home, and I think they might prefer to be casting their eyes over that dark-haired and handsome Member of Parliament for the 18th century. <laughs> now, of course, I'm referring to Ross Poldark, <laughs> my fictional predecessor who represented Truro. <laughs> now, I have to confess that even when I was in the Whip's office, I wasn't any use with a scythe. <laughs> and, uh, as, as, my, um, as my ancestors were Cornish tin miners, I think of myself more of as a de Manza than as a Ross. So we, we can all occasionally indulge in a bit of wishful thinking. <laughs> now, I felt a degree of consternation because I was asked to give the speech which, well, probably along with my honourable friend, I felt it was reserved for those people that whips had failed to reach the high watermark of their career in this place. So I don't know about you, Mr Speaker, but I still very much feel like I'm 35 and I think the best years are ahead of me. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it's nearly 10 years since I first spoke in this chamber, describing beautiful Cornwall and highlighting my creative, inventive, enterprising and determined constituents. Those qualities are as evident today as they were then. And thanks to the steps taken by government since 2010 and working with the many can-do people in my constituency, we're making real progress in improving the quality of people's lives. And the bills announced today, along with the recently announced increased investment in our public services, will be able to move further and faster in ensuring that everyone has the opportunity to reach their potential from improving education opportunities and access to high quality health and care services to better paid and high quality jobs. And the increase in the number of detectives painstakingly researching and gathering evidence to solve crime in our streets is most welcome. Yeah. Yeah. The funding attached is enough for 20,000 officers or one Colleen Rooney. <laughs> but most importantly, <laughs> Importantly of all, leaving our natural environment in better condition than we found it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our excellent local enterprise partnership has rightly identified Cornwall's abundance of natural resources, which, when harnessed, will make a massive contribution to the government's clean growth strategy. In my maiden speech, I singled out the potential for deep geothermal energy as a significant renewable energy technology. And I'm delighted to report to the House today that we now have the hottest, deepest hole in the UK. <laughs> and the trials to ge generate electricity are well underway. Now, it's been a long journey, and the determination of all involved in this project clearly illustrates the UK's global leadership on tackling climate change. We're now working on floating wind in the Celtic Sea, which has even greater potential. Yeah. Mr Speaker... The UK has decarbonised faster than any major economy, reducing our emissions by 38% since 1990. We know we need to go further and faster. 
which is I'm very proud that it was a Conservative a government that supported the world leading net zero target yeah. Yeah. and today yeah, is yeah, setting yeah. out measures that will enable us to do this. Yeah, the yeah. landmark environment bill is a huge step in ensuring we leave the natural environment in a better state than we found it. The bill will enable a comprehensive framework for legally binding targets, including a target for air quality and the establishment of a new office for environmental protection. Mm. Now, climate change, together with the threat to our national, natural environment, is the most serious challenge we face today. And our response must be comprehensive, with action taken across the whole economy. Yeah. But I'm confident we can do this. Why? Because there is now widespread concern and support for action, because we have what it takes to rise to this challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a real opportunity to grow our economy more sustainably, but also there's an opportunity to grow our economy more successfully. Yeah. Like members across this house, every week I have meetings with a wide range of people who are fully invested in wanting us to succeed in meeting our net zero target. Yep. Now, if we're to harness this enthusiasm and expertise, it can't just be about distant international summits with acronyms that few people understand. When the UK hosts the International UN Climate Summit in Glasgow next year, it must ensure that every sector of society is involved in the conversation. Yep. With an issue as big as climate change, we need everyone's collective brain power to find the right solutions, and we must have everyone on board if we're to implement them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Post-Brexit, the country needs to unite around a shared national purpose, and I believe this is it. Yes. By enabling comprehensive action on climate change across the whole of society with everyone involved and no one left behind, we can start rebuilding a truly united kingdom, one we can all be proud of. But that's the thing, Mr Speaker. We have to have that unity of purpose. We now have to agree on the one thing that we haven't been able to agree upon, the one thing that's holding the nation back and that is our future relationship with Europe. It's been <coughs> tough going, and we've debated this thoroughly for years. But it's this week, this week above all others, when we must redouble our efforts, compromise, and find a consensus on our way forward. So, Mr Speaker, I've been thinking about what we could do in this place to create the right atmosphere, the right mood, one that will promote trust, generate harmony and result in a consensus and that unity of purpose. So I was thinking, <coughs> what do we do when we're under pressure, when we're anxious, when success seems so far away? What do we do in our personal lives, with our families, in good times and bad, in our communities when we get together, whether in collective acts of worship or when our beloved football or rugby teams are playing? What we all do on these occasions is we sing. Yes. <laughs> yes. We sing on, because Sarah. it Go makes on. us all feel good. Yes. And now Gareth Malone, Gareth Malone has inspired the nation's workplaces, and he's proven that singing together increases feelings of trust and common purpose between people. So I thought, Mr. Speaker, what songs could we yeah, sing? Yeah, 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 yeah. On our way this Jesus week. Dog. Wheels on the bus. I thought perhaps we should begin with Queens Under Pressure, which could be an apt as with the ticking time scale of the Brexit deadline approaches at the end of October. Don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow by Fleetwood Mac could focus our minds both on our future relationship with Europe and the need to respond to the threats of climate change. <laughs> greater cooperation between all members in this house. We could be singing We're All In This Together from yeah. High School Musical or Meet Me Halfway by Black Eyed Peas. <laughs> I hope we could work our way through this songbook. We would eventually unite in a rousing rendition of Johnny Cash's I Can See Clearly Now, <laughs> leading us ultimately, I hope, to Gloria Gaynor's Let's Make a Deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, 
returning to our own shores, the Beatles can point us in the right direction with their song, We Can Work It Out. After all, Mr Speaker, that's what the nation expects us to do. Thank you. The question is...